Hi, Kara. Hey, Megan. How's it going? Oh, just feeling large and in charge. (laughs) (laughs) Kara's pregnant, in case y'all haven't heard. (laughs) Oh, my gosh, guys. Hey, welcome to my life. Did we tell you? (laughs) Did y'all know? This is the Witch's Magic Murder and Mystery Podcast. And I'm Kara. And I'm Megan. Hey, guys. We're recording remotely, so if you notice a difference in the audio, that's why. Yep. Just because life is crazy and it is, it really is. There's no other reason. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I just feel like, you know, in the summertime, we're like, oh, we'll get back into a routine. We didn't think about holidays at all and things happening. So I think I've been saying, wow, once I get past this, life will be normal Mm -hmm. again for like three years. And so at this point, I just need to give up on it. Uh, We did get through band season. May I tell you what? Everybody who was in marching band or is now a parent with a child in marching band. My hat's off to you. I had no idea until it's, Lauren started doing color guard how insane it was, how intense the schedule is. Yeah. yeah. Like I did cheerleading in high school and we had practice every day and games every weekend and all that. And basketball, we had a couple games a week or whatever, but like, it's just it nothing like, feel like that marching much. band. No. No. I, they're practicing all day long and every night and whatever. But anyway, they did make it to state, which was amazing. And they got so fourth cute. in their class. It was incredible. They were so, so, so good. I cried. Oh, I cried because I'm an emotional disaster. That's adorable. <laughs> uh, I was just so proud of them. I know how hard they've worked. I was so yeah, happy them, they've so. been working yeah. their little butts off. And then we had my birthday on Halloween. You guys, I was sitting at my front porch giving out oh candy. And I looked up and there's Willow. And I was oh so excited. My gosh. And then yeah, there was my, Kara right behind her. Here we are. Yeah, my sister lives in the neighborhood right next to Megan's. And we're walking. Before we know it, Brian's like, uh, we're really close to Megan's house. So I told Willow, I was like, Willow, guess whose house we are really close to? She just takes off running like she knows where <laughs> she's headed. I was like, whatever. I just love that job. <laughs> It was so great to see you. It, it was, was such a nice so birthday funny. surprise. Like, all your little friends were like, this is Willow. <laughs> yeah. So Kara just happened to show up at the same time that like my neighborhood friends, they like walked over and sang happy birthday and brought me a cupcake. It was really sweet. So cute. And yeah, I really have the best friends. And so as soon as they see Kara, a lot of them have never met Kara. Actually, I don't think any of them that were there at that time oh, had yeah. met you and so but they all knew you because of the podcast right, right? so that was pretty fun too it so. was so cute so anyway it's been a great week and now yeah. we're here with the podcast which is another exciting right. i love i love recording time i do too it's good for the soul so we have my episode today mm-hmm. first i wanted to talk about we did not put up an episode this past tuesday and here's why <laughs> we had recorded one I researched an episode about a little boy who was found in a suitcase in Indiana earlier this year. And it was a story that I did not know about until someone put it in our Facebook group. Yeah. And which is surprising because it was really close um, Mm -hmm. to Kentucky. And I'm just surprised I hadn't heard about it. Yeah, it it had some like, what, Louisville ties? Yeah. Well, the area it was found in, they considered part of the Louisville metropolitan area even though it's in Indiana. So right. um, I was like, well, let's do it on the podcast. It's not like we have a huge listenership, but we've reached some people, especially in this area. And so I was like, let's just see if we can get the story out. Yeah. His body was discovered in April. And as of the morning of October 26, 2022, he was still unidentified. Mm-hmm. So we recorded our episode about him that day. And then later, Indiana State Police announced that they had identified him. Which is yeah, it was literally like amazing five news. hours later. Yeah, yeah. Kara sends me a screenshot and I was like, oh. <laughs> so just to give you a quick summary of that case, the Indiana State Police, they did really incredible work on this case. They said that they didn't find his identity based on any tips that were called in on the tip line. Mm-hmm. Which were thousands. Yes. And that's so interesting to me. So I'm really curious about how they managed to find him. The boy found in the suitcase in Indiana was five-year-old Cairo Amar Jordan of Atlanta, Georgia. He had not been reported missing, so he wasn't in any national databases, which is why it had taken so long to identify him. Uh, One woman has been arrested in connection with his death. That's 40-year-old Donna Lane Coleman. It's unclear what her role was in the murder. And then Cairo's mother, 37-year-old, I, mm -mm, let's see, Mm Dewan. It's D-E-J-U-A-N-E, Dewan. Maybe. Ludie Anderson, maybe, is also wanted, but she's still at large. She's on the lam. Yeah. I mean, if 
if this goes like last time, maybe after we finish recording, they'll announce that they found her, which is my hope yes. <laughs> at this point. Yes. So, I mean, that's really the goal for all these episodes, right? Like, let's have them solve it before we can even post the episode. Yes, That'd be great. I would love that. <laughs> According to her social media posts, uh, the woman, Dewan, who was Cairo's mother, she believed a demon lived inside her son from... December 2021 through April 2022, she posted on Facebook and Twitter that she believed her son should be exercised or killed. Yeah, she thought he was like an old man or something. Yeah, I mean, she she just basically thought that some sort of demon had taken over his body. Yeah. On her posts, she wrote about rituals and protection spells and reversal spells. Mm Mm-hmm. On April 8th, I'm going to, here's a quote. This is one of her posts. It says, just because the avatar is of what we call a child, which I think avatar is, she means the body that the child is in. Right. So just because the avatar is of what we call a child does not mean that it is actually a child. There are beings that are here that are not supposed to be here that pick avatars to hide behind, to play roles, to steal energy, and to ruin lives. You better check to see if the children that you think are children actually have souls. And it's just like, oh my gosh. That's terrifying. It's so scary. A couple days after that, she wrote, most children aren't even really children. Mm -hmm. And then six days later, a mushroom hunter discovered Cairo's body in Indiana. So the posts of hers that I've read, they're screenshots that I've seen uh, on news articles. But it shows that the posts were public. There are several interactions. There are likes and loves and shocked face emojis and lots of comments. And of course, I can't read any of the comments. Maybe all of the comments are just her replying to herself. I have no idea. Right, yeah. But it does seem that a lot of people did see the posts. And I don't I don't think anyone's to blame here. Um, I think she's clearly mentally ill. And I think that no one expects something like this to happen, mm-hmm. right? It's really easy yeah. to look back and be like, how could no one have seen it? How could no one have done anything? Right. And as someone, I mean, we've had situations in my family with people who have a drug problem or a mental mm-hmm. problem or both. And it and when there's children involved, it is very like, what do we do? You right. know? Because no one wants a child to be taken away. And at the same time, no one wants the child to be in danger. And, exactly. and it's just it's just terrible. And another issue here is that no one seemed, from what I can tell, it seemed like maybe they were kind of transient. Um, It wasn't uncommon Mm -hmm. for the rest of her family to go long periods of time without hearing from her or seeing Cairo. So that's why, like, no one was reported missing because it was kind of like, well, maybe she's just gone again. We'll see her in a while. But the whole thing I wanted to say is if you see things like this on social media, just remember stories like this and learn from it. Like, whether a child is involved or not, don't just scroll past it. Don't just think, wow, this person's losing it and screenshot it right. and send it to your friends and right. laugh about it. Like, it's more than some wild thing you saw on social media, you know? Yeah. So that's one thing. But speaking of mysteries being solved, it's been a big week in the true crime world mm-hmm. for those of you who have been following true crime stuff for a while. There was a press conference on Halloween Day to announce that an arrest has been made in the Delphi murders. So oh, crazy. Which blew my mind. I could not believe it. No. It's one of those cases that is always stuck in my head, I think, because it was two little girls that were killed, and I have two little girls, and it's just Mm -hmm. like, you know, you just think about that kind of stuff. Yep. In case you're not familiar with it, back in 2017, two eighth-grade girls, best friends Abby Williams and Libby German, were murdered in Delphi, Indiana. They were killed in the middle of the day on a hiking trail. It's never been released how they were killed. Um, Mm -hmm. but a key factor in the case is that Libby managed to capture a video of a man on her smartphone before she died. And it was always presumed, oh my gosh, like how incredibly brave is that little girl? And just quick thinking, you know, and just just so, so smart. Um, it's always been presumed that this is the person who killed her or killed them. Yeah. In the video, you can see him walking and hear his voice. Only short clips of the video have been released to the public and it's, it seems that the video might be a big part in nailing the guy who murdered them. Right. Yeah. It's been a huge ongoing case. They've had lots of persons of interest, but this is the first time that anyone has been officially arrested and charged, which makes me think they must be pretty sure it's him. They must have some pretty yeah. solid evidence. Yeah. The man in custody is Richard Allen. He's 50 years old. He lives there in Delphi, which that also blows my mind. I guess mm-hmm. I had it in my head that whoever it was was probably long gone, you know? Right. But this person has lived there in that small town 
oh. pretty close to the park where they died this whole time. Yeah, this whole seeing time. Seeing the posters of their faces, hearing people talk about it. He has just lived there this whole time. Just, yeah. And I, I mean, the radar, he's, just not yeah. making anything suspicious. He's innocent yeah. until proven guilty. Right. <laughs> Mm-hmm. allegedly allegedly whatever but like i'm just fascinated yeah so we don't exactly know how the police found him we don't know what led to it yeah i'm just so thankful that someone is in custody and it seems like we might finally have an answer right okay one more big update before i get to my story for today this one made me really happy because i did an episode on this case um back in episode 73 which was a little over a year ago we talked Gosh, about that was a hot minute ago yes the lady of the dunes yes and back then, she was Massachusetts' oldest, as in longest running, not her age, mm-hmm. unidentified murder victim. And now, she has a name. My gosh. Ruth Marie Terry, born in Tennessee, but she also had ties to California, Massachusetts, and Michigan. She was a daughter, sister, aunt, wife, and mother. And she was identified thanks to genealogical DNA, which we're seeing happen more and more. And that is just so, so amazing. Mm-hmm. And now that they have her name, police can investigate who she was and what was going on in her life and hopefully find an answer as to why she might have been murdered and by who. Yeah. So now if someone could just identify Philadelphia's boy in the box from episode 82, that would just... We would be so happy and (laughs) tell us where the solder children are. Yes. Can we just (laughs) solve all the mysteries? (laughs) Yes, please. Okay, so that's the end of the update portion of the episode. But I was just like, gosh, there's been so many things that happened this week. And I don't want to, you know. Right. I want to say something Skip about all of them. over anything, yeah. So, okay, all right. Are you ready for this week's episode? I believe so. <laughs> I feel pretty confident that this one will not be solved between the time we record okay. and the time it gets posted. Because this story starts on May 26, 1828. Oh. Mm-hmm. I mean, you never know. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it could, I guess. There's, there's, I'll talk about it at the end, but I, I doubt it. Okay. I just really love these old oh my gosh, historical ones. Okay. So on May 26th, 1828, a teenage boy wanders into Nuremberg, Germany. He's wearing tattered clothing and he has two letters on him. One letter is addressed to Captain von Wessening. What a name. Mm-hmm. the captain of the 4th Squadron of the 6th Cavalry Regiment. Mm. And it states that the boy's name was Casper Hauser, okay. and it asked that the captain take Casper in and care for him. Oh. The l- letter was written by the teenager's previous caretaker, someone who said he had taken in the abandoned boy and raised him like a son but could no longer care for him. Oh. He went on to say, we are not related, uh-huh. but... The boy was born in April of 1812, and he has never left my house because I didn't want anyone to know where he was kept. Oh. So, already you're like, what? Right. (laughs) Why? Yeah. He's been kept inside for, what, 16 years? Right. The letter said that the boy could read and write, and if he had only grown up with parents, he would have been an educated boy. Oh. Which I guess means formally educated, which suggests that maybe his parents were well off, possibly, or like in a position to have him educated. Right. The letter ended with the caretaker saying, it would have cost me my neck to escort the boy to Nuremberg myself, which is why he was sent alone. Oh. So all of those things are like, there's already just in that one letter so many little mysteries, right? Right. Why? Why would it, what what would have been dangerous about it? I don't understand. The second letter was not to the captain. It was a letter dated 1812 that had been written by the boy's mother, and it said that the boy's father was dead and that he was being sent to the military because she couldn't take care of him. Oh. But right away, I'm like, the military? Yeah. The letter was written in 1812, which is when he was born. So was she sitting him to the military when he was born? Like, I don't understand what that is. And I I tried to figure it out, and I... I finally gave up. Yeah, like, how did we get here? Right. Maybe she meant that her plan was that once he got a little older, he was going to be sent to the military. Like, his father's dead, and that's the only thing I know to do. Yeah. Child soldiers were used in World Wars I and II, so presumably they were used before that, too. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's, like, because of who his father was, which we don't know, but maybe it was a given. Like, 
Yeah. Because his dad was this, that means he needs to go into the military. Like maybe his dad was some kind right. of right. war hero or powerful yeah, person or something. True. Anyway, Casper had no memory of who he was or where he came from. And to be honest, he was a little weird. Uh, right. People said he acted like a very young child. He was Aww. just sort of like in awe of everything. You know that whole like the way that toddlers are just like, whoa, wow, what about everything. This? Yeah. Yeah. That's sort of how he acted. And he had, they said, uncivilized manners. Okay. And. So he, like he really had been in the house for a long time. Yes. Okay. It all matches up with that story. And okay. he preferred bread and water to meats and vegetables. Like oh. they would try to give him other food. And he's like, no, no, no. Bread and water, please. No, it sounds like Mabel and her donuts. <laughs> <laughs> that I will only eat donuts. Donuts, yes. <laughs> it's like me and peanut butter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they also said that the way he lo- walked was kind of like a toddler. Like he was just learning how. Oh, wow. Um. But people were also like, he's fine. He's not a madman or mentally disabled in any way. He's fine. He's right. just a little odd. Yeah. So he didn't talk much unless he was just repeating back what people said to him. Okay. Like a toddler learning to speak. Mm-hmm. Huh. Okay. He was familiar with money and he could say some prayers, huh. but he had a pretty limited vocabulary. He was familiar with money? Right. Okay. So he knew what money was and it said most of his limited vocabulary had to do with horses. Like he'd say... Over and over, like it was a phrase he had just learned, I want to be a cavalry man like my father was. Oh. I want to be a cavalry man like my father was. Oh. And horse, horse. So he had these phrases he would just kind of repeat. Okay. Not knowing what to do with the boy, it was finally decided that Casper would be kept in the town jail as a vagabond. Oh. So that's where he stayed for two months. Okay. Yeah. It <laughs> seems like a weird uh, choice, yeah. but I guess, I mean, he's a 16-year-old boy and it's like, what do we do? Right. So... While he was kept there, people continued to work with him. Someone brought in a candle, and Casper seemed completely amazed by the flame, oh. trying to grab it, and it burned his hand. Oh, wow. And he had the same amazed reaction to his reflection in a mirror. He seemed confused, what? and he tried to reach out and, like, touch it. So it's, like, as if he's never seen these things yeah. before. Yeah. Some people thought that maybe Casper had been like a feral child who had raised himself in the woods. But then oh, man, where did the letters feral come child from? Stories are something else. Yes, I know. So he was released from jail and became a ward of the city, taken in by a nobleman named Lord Stanhope. And this is when he really started making progress. Oh. He got way better at communication, making strides pretty quickly. Oh. And now, armed with the ability to communicate better, mm -hmm. Casper begins talking about his life up to this point. Okay. So, like, nothing's happened to him. Like, he still has these memories and stuff. Yes. Okay. That's when we learn that before he showed up in Nuremberg, Casper had lived the entirety of his life in a small cell. So, mm -hmm. some of the articles refer to it as a prison, but it was just like he was in this guy's house, like, in the basement. Okay? Okay. Um. The area he lived in was six feet long, three feet wide, and three and a half feet tall. I'm what? going to refer to it as a cell kind of throughout when I talk about it, but I don't know that it was like a jail cell okay. per se. He slept on a bed made of straw. What? And he had only bread and water to eat and drink. Wow. He said that when he drank the water, it tasted bitter and made him really sleepy, which sounds like oh. maybe he was drugged. Yeah. When he was finally allowed to leave... A man escorted him to the outskirts of Nuremberg, and the whole time they were walking, Casper was told to look at the ground so that he wouldn't be able to tell where he was coming from. Aww. So when they got just outside of town, he was given the two letters and abandoned and was just like, go ahead, Aww. head on by yourself. See you, bye. Right. He also talked about this dream he had often where he was inside a huge castle and there was a woman in fancy clothes and a man dressed all in black and the man carried a sword. Which immediately made me think of the Princess Bride, and I had a whole oh like my gosh. moment. <laughs> my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed yes, my father. And it was the Dread Pirate Roberts. Yes. <laughs> Prepare to die. <laughs> yes, as you wish. <laughs> now, at this point, Casper is becoming something of a celebrity, which I'll right. get to in a few minutes. But there are people who are studying him because he's such a mystery. Mm -hmm. Like, here's this teenage boy who seems to have been raised in secrecy, completely away from other people. Without learning the things he should have learned. I mean, not just basic education, right. but also things like eating food besides bread and walking Appar normally. Yeah, and apparently like how to stand. Like what? Right. So, but I mean, they said the cell he was in was like three and a half feet tall. 
which is super bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, wow. I don't know. Eventually, Casper went to live with a professor who was studying him, Friedrich Dahmer. Mm -hmm. Friedrich. Yeah. A schoolmaster and a speculative philosopher. Wow. Dahmer theorized that Casper's dream about being in the castle was actually a very early life memory before he was put into the small cell that he lived in for the majority of his life. Oh. When he goes to live with the professor, we learn that Casper was a super talented artist with a knack for drawing. And you can still see some of his drawings if you look them up on the internet. Huh. It's pretty cool. As hard as he tried, Dahmer learned little more than we already know about Casper's background. Then, in 1829, <laughs> I don't know why that came out so weird. 29. <laughs> 29. <laughs> Then, in 1829, about a year after he appeared in Nuremberg, Casper was attacked in Dahmer's home. Whoa. Professor Dahmer found Casper in the basement with a head wound, bleeding profusely. Casper said he had not seen his attacker, but he had recognized the voice as that of the man who had escorted him to Nuremberg. What? And the attacker had told him that he would die if he ever left Nuremberg and then bludgeoned him in the head, which is a weird thing to say. Yeah. Like, you're going to die if you ever leave here, and now I'm going to, you might die also right now. <laughs> right. I, I feel like it's weird. Lead out too, so I like, why know. did, what kind of warning are you giving him, and then also right. bludgeoning him in the head? Like, I don't understand. Why are you giving him so many mixed signals? <laughs> <laughs> it's so confusing. He's already having trouble communicating. Right. So then... The next year, in 1830, Casper was attacked again. My God. This time, he was shot. What? Yeah. Again, he did not see who shot him. And again, he survived. Oh, my gosh. And then, three years go by. And on December 14th, 1833, Casper came stumbling through the door of Lord Stanhope's home. He was clutching his side and talking very fast saying he had been lured to the park by a stranger, and then the stranger had stabbed him in the side. What? People were like, okay. <laughs> oh, this is a lot. Can you take us and show us where this happened? Yeah. And it seemed like they didn't quite believe him. Oh, so he's So Casper tried to lead them back to the spot where he was stabbed, but on the way, he collapsed, and he died three days later <gasps> from his stab wound. Oh, no. Yeah, so he actually died on December 17th, 1833. Oh, my gosh. He was buried in Ansbach. Mm-hmm. Ansbach. Ansbach. I don't know. And his headstone reads in Latin, but I'm going to say it in English just for you guys, for, not yeah, for myself. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, 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 because you got that down. Here lies Casper Hauser. Hauser. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Riddle of his time. Aww. His birth was unknown. His death mysterious. 1833. Oh, wow. I want this. Everybody take note. Ready? Yep. When I die, mm -hmm. if I die, mm -hmm. I would like it to say, here lies Megan Whitmer. Riddle of her time. Riddle I think that is the time. coolest. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just love that. <laughs> the riddle. Riddle of her time. Riddle of her time. Enigma. Yes. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Megan Whitmer, comma. Enigma. Enigma. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there were hundreds of books, magazines, articles, and later films and even plays written about Casper Hauser. Oh my gosh. In 1874, there's an article that said the following. One of the strangest stories of the century is that of Casper Hauser. For a quarter of a century, from 1828 to 1853, it is doubtful if any single individual in all of Europe was so much discussed or awoke so great an interest and curiosity. Aww. The newspapers on both sides of the ocean were full of him. Pamphlets and booklets were printed to sustain this or that theory of his birth and belongings. Philanthropists, philosophers, and savants were aroused on his behalf. They were aroused on his behalf. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes, they were. So. Wow. That's... <laughs> they, they did a lot. <laughs> uh that's so crazy though like i'm sure that guy just kept trying to come back and kill him like dude i you guess learned to say too much but also how did these people keep getting in the castle well he's just in his home like just a normal home at this point oh yeah that's true but still how do yeah, they get in yeah, the yeah, home yeah. and no one else sees them so right 
everyone wanted to know who was Casper Hauser. And this is a mystery that lives on today. People are still investigating it. Trying to unravel the mystery relies heavily on how much we believe about what Casper said. Right. So let's start at the beginning. It's a very good place to start. It How's that really sound? is. <laughs> a very good place to start. <laughs> okay. He had the two letters. Analysis of the letters seems to show that they were written by the same person. Okay. Now, does that mean the person was Casper or someone else? Like, yeah, was he faking it to right. where he knew exactly what he was writing? Because if he wasn't, he had no idea. Right. So it may be that Casper's captor, Casper's captor, wrote mm-hmm. both letters. I mean, I did that to myself. <laughs> he could have, so Casper's captor could have written both letters. <laughs> But Casper didn't know that and really believed right. that the 1812 letter was written by his mother. Or right. maybe Casper wrote them both. Or last one would be that Casper didn't write them both, but he did know they were both fake. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, exactly. Then there's his story about being kept in that tiny cell for years and years. Uh huh. He claimed he had spent his entire life alone as a prisoner in that tiny room with no light. But you would expect that if that were true, if he had gone nearly 16 years without sunlight, then there would be, like, physical repercussions okay, to his body. Yeah, I was going to say, like, he would yeah. have all sorts of crazy, like, iron deficiencies mm-hmm. and, like, all the things. I mean, let alone the mental impact that it would have on you, right? Yes. But at the very least, the lack of exposure to sunlight would have meant his body wouldn't produce enough vitamin D. And then, like, yeah, probably would have resulted in rickets, like a bone softening disease. Mm-hmm. And the article I read was like, nothing in the records mentions anything about any sort of bone deformities. But I did keep thinking about how they said he walked weird. Right. Oh, yeah, that's true. And I was like, I don't know. But probably these people have studied this better than I have. (laughs) So if they say there's no bone deformities, then I guess probably there weren't. But I just think it's interesting to think they did say he walked strangely. The whole vitamin D thing. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but when I went so quick, real quick, you guys aside. When I wrote my book and got the book deal, I wrote my book as a standalone book. And then when my publisher made the offer, they wanted it to be a trilogy. And so I had to take my standalone book and rewrite it and make it a trilogy. Mm -hmm. And so I always joke that I've written five books, but they're all named between and they all have the same characters. Right, exactly. And different, you know, different things happen. But I basically didn't leave my house hardly at all for like a year. Yeah. And... I'm not exaggerating that in any way. People in my neighborhood, because we had just moved here, like there are people who didn't know I existed. They thought that I was dead. They thought my husband was a widower. (laughs) They thought, like, because they would see him and never me. Yeah. And then I went to the doctor just for like a normal reason. And they tested like all my levels of everything. And they were like, oh my God, your vitamin D is 17. And it's like, apparently 20 is really low. What have you been doing with your life? (laughs) My doctor was like, what? do you do all day? Like, where have you been? And I'm like, well, I've just been in my bedroom for a year. Basically. Uh, yeah. and it was rough. And it was like, I was super, super depressed, which was like, when you don't get outside enough, and there's a reason people are like, go right. outside, yeah, which exactly. sounds so basic mm-hmm. when you're depressed, but it really does help. And I don't does, mean yeah. that it's a complete cure, but I mean, it's something. Get some sunshine in your life. Yeah. All that to say, go outside. If you're feeling sad, go outside. Yes. All right. So Casper was attacked three times. And in all three cases, there were no witnesses. In the first attack, he was alone in the cellar and never saw his attacker. In the second attack, he was alone in his bedroom and never saw his attacker. And in the third, he was alone when he was lured to the park. Oh, yeah. An investigation of the spot where Casper was stabbed showed only one set of footprints in the snow. And there was a small purse found with a handwritten note inside that seemed to have been written by the killer. And... Here's what it said in German, which, again, I could read perfectly, right. but I'm just going to translate it to English for you guys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just for you. Yeah. Okay? Not for me, because yes. I am a genius. Yeah. Hauser will be able to tell you quite precisely how I look and from where I am. To save Hauser the effort, I want to tell you myself from where I come. I come from, and it's like indecipherable, mm. the Bavarian border on the river. Okay. I will even tell you the name. M. L O. So it's a note from the killer that like he wants to tell you who he is. Yeah. Why? Why would a killer write this note? Right. Why would this happen? 
Yeah. So this raised suspicions that Casper had staged the whole thing mm. and had accidentally ended up killing himself. Like right. he hadn't meant to mortally yeah. wound himself, but that he had. So that's one theory, right? Like that the whole thing was made up and the attacks on Casper were staged. Some people thought maybe Casper was an undiagnosed epileptic and that some of his claims and visions might have some sort of medical cause, oh. which I think is like you're bending over backwards to try and be kind. It's yeah. like we're saying we don't believe anything he said, yeah. but we're also not exactly going to call him a liar. Right. We're going to pretend that there's some reason, right? We think that something happened. It just seems like there's no other evidence of yeah. that. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Others think that Casper was delusional, perhaps driven mad by the neglect and, b- and abuse that he had suffered mm-hmm. being held captive for the majority of his life. Right. But that would also mean you'd have to believe that he was telling the truth about being held captive for well, the yeah. majority of his life. Yeah. So. At what point are you saying the lies Like, started? yeah, when did they, where did they manifest? Like, where did this happen? Like, what? Right. I don't know. Yeah. Then there's the possibility that he was mentally ill, like a pathological liar. But to come up with all of those, like, from start to finish? Have you ever dealt with a pathological liar? Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah. Like, I've had, you know... I'll make offhand comments like, well, that person's a compulsive liar. But like, I've only had one person who I'm actually like, that person is actually seriously a pathological liar. Yeah. And it really will make you feel insane, particularly if you're like me, where I always want want to understand why a person did a thing. Yeah. Because the thing with pathological liars, right, they don't have a clear motive. There is no end game. There is no, oh, this person lied in order to do this thing. No, it's like sometimes the simplest things and other times you're like, what? So I'm bringing this up because I think when we start to speculate that Casper made the whole thing up, the natural inclination is to want a motive like Mm -hmm. why would he make all this up how did he expect to get away with it exactly why would he need to add the drama of the attempts being made on his life and the hardest part to accept is there isn't always a why like sometimes people are just really 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 messed up right just out there and we can probably say that for a lot of people we've discussed on this podcast yep Another thing we've talked about on the podcast before is Munchausen syndrome, uh-huh. where that's okay. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, like it's a little different than cases I would think of for Munchausen's because right. a lot of times it involves an illness, but it is about getting sympathy and attention, and that could be involved, particularly with the attacks on himself. Right. It could have started out by proxy, and then it could have continued on to where he carried it out himself. That's true. And even his backstory being like this poor, neglected child who grew up basically in a prison cell, that would attract that same Uh type of sympathetic attention, you know? This whole thing of pretending to have grown up abandoned or raised by animals has actually happened several times throughout history. Yeah. Even recently. This one fascinated me. In 2011, there was a teenager in Germany Mm -hmm. who said his name was Ray, and he said that he had lived alone in a forest for at least five years. And he was like, I don't know who I am or where I came from. They do an investigation, and they find out that Ray is actually a 21-year-old Dutchman who got bored with his office job and basically just decided to pull off this big hoax. Uh Uh-huh. And I'm like, what? Why? What? How? Why? What What are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. What are you doing? How bored? Write a book. Yeah. (laughs) You get this kind of imagination, and you're bored. Go do something productive. So. Maybe that guy was the 2011 version of Casper Hauser. Like, maybe Casper had just been living his life somewhere and had a big imagination and got super bored and decided to just make up this huge story and then live it out. (laughs) Exactly. For no other reason than, like, why not? (laughs) Right. That's hilarious. But now I'm going to flip things around and talk about Casper from the perspective of believing his story. Mm -hmm. So, we have to go back to 1812. When Casper was supposedly born, as Uh far as we know. Uh I'm not sure if it's Charles or Carl, because I can't even tell what I typed here. It's it's all messed up. (laughs) Grand Duke of Baden, Mm -hmm. probably. Mm -hmm. These are names I definitely meant to look up. I Um, like them. It sounds good. And Stephanie de... You haven't even heard this one yet. Stephanie de (laughs) Biarharnes. Oh, amazing. Boharnes. Boharnes. I don't know, you guys. It sounds like a dip you would. We're going to call her Stephanie. (laughs) It sounds like a sauce. (laughs) Yeah. 
<laughs> so we're going to call her Stephanie. Okay, um, she was the Duke's wife and the adopted daughter of Napoleon. Hmm. And they had a son who would become the Prince of Baden. And he would be first in line for succession as Charles' only male child. Okay. And apparently, this son was born on September 29th, 1812, which is the same year that Casper was born. Right. And this son also died a month later on October 16th, 1812. Oh, okay. But maybe he didn't die. Maybe he did it. Maybe he was stolen in order to clear the way for the Duke's uncle to become his successor. A Lindbergh baby situation. Except it's royal. Right. So one of the articles I read about a research study that was performed about this in 1998 called this the most widely accepted theory about Casper's identity, which I found surprising. Oh. So. In 1876, a man with a very complicated last name, so we're mm-hmm. just going to call him Otto, um, <laughs> Otto used official documents to discredit this theory. I think the big thing here is that Stephanie, the Grand Duchess, she never saw her dead son because she was very sick. Oh. So people were like, see, she never even saw the body because there was no body. Okay. But there were other people who did see the dead body, the child's father, the grandmother, the aunt. There were 10 court physicians and nurses. So there were several people who could say they witnessed it. And then in 1951, the Grand Duke's mother, which would have been the child's grandmother, Mm -hmm. her letters were published and they gave more details about the baby's birth, illness, and death. So it seems like the most logical theory is that Casper was an imposter. That's also like the most boring theory. Yeah. Like, nobody wants that to be it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Let's mix it up. Like, secret royalty? Are you kidding me? Yeah. yeah. I've seen The Man in the Iron Mask. I used to exactly. own that movie. I can't even tell you how many times I've watched it. Right. The maybe he was kidnapped because he's actually royalty and that's why he had to be kept mm-hmm. hidden. That theory was going around even when Casper was still alive. So it's like Rapunzel, but the male version. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but if he made it up, it's almost like, remember the parts in that first letter that were like, we didn't want anyone to know where he was being kept. And yes. if anyone saw me bring him to Nuremberg, it could cost me my life and all right. that. If we're saying Casper made this whole thing up, it's almost like he purposely put those things into place in order to lead people down that path. Uh-huh. So you have to believe he's that smart, that he orchestrated it to that extent. Yeah. But then was not smart enough to think through that there should be a second set of footprints at the place that he was attacked in yeah. the snow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or maybe he was telling the truth. Maybe it was a Death Eater. (laughs) (laughs) Like I said, people have been obsessed with this for a long time. And in 1996, a DNA analysis was performed on a bloodstain from the clothes worn by Casper Hauser when he was stabbed. The DNA was compared to blood samples from two living maternal relatives of Stephanie, which would have been the prince's mother. Mm -hmm. And the samples did not match, which proves the blood stain on Casper's clothing did not come from a son of the duchess. The thing is, the summary of the study says that the blood stain came from clothing most likely worn by Casper Hauser, which made me wonder, like, most likely, are you not 100% certain? Yeah. And then in 2002, more analysis was done using hair and body cells from locks of hair and clothing that had belonged to Casper Hauser. Mm -hmm. Um, They they took analysis of six different samples and compared it to a descendant in the female line of Stephanie. Okay. And they weren't identical, but the deviation was not large enough to exclude a relationship completely. Oh. So they were saying that it's possible that the reason they didn't match, the deviation was so small that it could have just been caused by some sort of like genetic mutation. Right. The Baden family won't allow any examination of the remains of Stephanie de Baharnes, mm-hmm. nor that of the child that was supposedly probably died in 1812. Okay. So they still haven't 100% ruled, ruled out, out the Prince of Baden theory. Huh. I mean, at this point, I don't think we're ever going to know. Right. And I think if there is a royal secret, they'll just... It's like you it's can't just, believe it's going anything. To but, the grave you know, with all of them, yeah, <laughs> right. They'll just say whatever they have to say. Even right. the people who are like all the witnesses who are like, we definitely saw the child dead. Yeah, and they're well, like, you okay, could just be saying you... that because it's a royal secret. Yeah. Also, maybe they did. Maybe they really did. <laughs> so it's just interesting to speculate. It's one of those again that we'll probably never know. Although, like at the very beginning, it could be solved by DNA, perhaps someday. Yeah. 
with the advances that are being made in DNA technology. Man, I hope I do a like an ancestry thing one day and I get a little leaf that pops up and it's like, hey, did you know that you're from this part of this part in yeah. these times? And this is your yeah. second cousin twice removed. <laughs> it's not going to be second cousin. Casper yeah. Hauser. <laughs> All right. So that's my story about it. Casper Hauser and the mystery and who he so, was. Wow. Yeah. Maybe he's a big royal secret, or maybe he's just maybe he's an incredibly royalty, good con maybe man. Maybe he's a feral child. Maybe he's a con man. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Who knows? All right, you guys. Thank you for listening. Yeah. We'll be back Tuesday with another episode. We will. <laughs> okay. We love you. So much. Goodbye. Goodbye.